for me, The Prestige is very much about filmmaking. It's very much about what I do. It's also intended to suggest to the audience some of those ideas about how the film itself is spooling its, its narrative out to the audience. We want people really to be aware of uh, the effect the film is having on them as, it, as it's uh, uh, unfolding before their eyes. I like to work on films where the, uh, the genre is not defined through the most superficial aspects of the, the piece. That is to say, I wouldn't want people to look at the prestige and determine that it, the genre it fit in was period films, even though uh, the costume and the production design and everything obviously are of the Victorian period. The Victorian era is often mischaracterized as being stuffy and repressive. I mean, really, it was an extraordinarily exciting time human development and the Industrial Revolution, the birth of electricity, the birth of cinema and photography, people traveling the world, you know, development the theory of evolution, science was being turned on its head in all kinds of ways at this period. It was a period of great intellectual adventurousness and huge change uh, in society that's still being felt today. I mean, the world was made smaller, really, for the first time. There's an interesting relationship in the film between the scientists of the day who were essentially the new magicians who were going to take over from the, the more traditional form um, and the way in which magicians of the day co-opted the imagery of science and the, the methodology and terminology rather of science uh, to sell old tricks in a new way uh, to audiences of the day. In America at this time, spiritualism was a greater religion than Christianity. So there were more spiritualists than there were Christians. The obsession with contacting the afterlife, being in contact with seances, um, so on, informed magicians' acts and, and what made them seem incredible. But you know, there were people scamming on doing these seances everywhere, like people making fortunes out of this thing. A lot of magicians did this um, simply to stay alive. It was the kind of, um, it was like writing for magazines. That what you did was you went to, to bereave families and did a seance to put them in touch with their beloved ones who died. To me, there's always a certain element of comedy to it, you know? I mean, deadpan, but uh, I, like, I like the kind of, um, the, the, you know, the con man uh, aspect of it. And, uh, you know, you speak with most magicians and I think they, they like it to be referred to as, uh, you know, as an art. The idea of uh, characters who are engaged in deceit as their livelihood and as their life's passion, the growth of new ideas, the birth of modern scientific ideas and so forth. But all of those ideas to me are modern ideas, just as interesting in, in today's world. And so I didn't really want the film to feel too much as if it were set in the past. I really wanted to try and emphasize the aspects of that world that are exciting to a modern audience. It was a period in which uh, there was far more visual advertising than there is now. Posters were everywhere, text was everywhere, and our backlot streets were intended to represent that. There's a messiness, there's a, uh, a hard sell quality, there's a lot of imagery um, assaulting people walking down the streets in a way that actually exceeds even what we have today, because this is an era pre-television, pre-radio, uh, where advertising was really coming into its own for the first time. I want it to be like the Victorian uh, version of Tokyo, so it's very chaotic, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's the start of a modern world, it's like Victorian advertising, it's the start of mechanising, it's the Industrial Revolution. So LA doesn't seem like the obvious choice, but actually it has, it's the one town that actually has, you know, six or seven old theatres that uh, aren't being used on a regular basis, like the one we're in now. We are standing on the Universal back lot, uh, which we've converted into uh, London streets. So this is why we're here. We've got two main day uh, scenes, and really we're going to shoot one of them completely in this direction. You know, there's a lot of depth 
down this way and you kind of follow someone down there and through the alley. So we've got moments and they really are moments. His sets always look so wonderful and so real that I can put the camera six inches away from a set wall and I know it's going to hold up on the big screen. His sets always allow me to light them in a dark moody fashion. The material that Chris writes uh, and, and the way he wants a picture to look and the way I light all sort of works together. We wanted to be accurate to the feeling of the period, the industrial quality of the period, the period of density of information and so forth uh, in the time that we really wanted to, to get across. First times in which the world would have felt too confusing to people living in London at the time. It certainly wouldn't have been uh, any more perfect than the world we live in, probably less so, in which case uh, it seems appropriate to really mess up that world, really try and shake it up. And, have it be really coming a part of the scenes. You want to give it Victorian modernism, so it has some kind of, uh, you know, edge to it, because we're not making a period drama. We don't have rows of Nash terrace houses and horse-drawn carts and, uh, you know, wigs. So <laughs> Sarah, what are you doing? I was really determined not to cast people who uh, done lots of period work and could obviously be seen uh, in that period because we wanted every aspect of the film to be uh, more contemporary, more accessible, more real than that, frankly. Chris started showing me some of the wardrobe that people are going to wear and then we put it on camera. And what I've really loved is, is that it's, it's all in this muted earth tone, darker tones that really help uh, help keep the mood of this picture. And for me, when the wardrobe is kept down, in some cases for the shows themselves, you know, these bold whites and blacks which create wonderful contrast, and in, in the scenes in streets and background action, it's all very much in a, in a darker tonal range, and that allows the faces to pop out, and that gives us a beautiful contrast, I think. Um, this is one of my performance costumes. It has a big tail that comes out the back and that's stuck in the wardrobe truck somewhere. You know, I don't have to wear a lot of those very tight, lacy, um, sort of restrictive collars and the big bustle and everything. I have much more colorful wardrobe. What I did with all the show clothes, they're my favorite costumes probably because I tried to design for her something that was as modern and sexy and kind of foxy is a better word, interpretation. Got the flowers and um, flowers are also in my hair. I wanted women in the audience to sit there and say, wow, you know, I could wear that and would that I look like that, I would look that good in it. Well, Victorian clothes, if you're wealthy, clothes in the back because you have staff to put to do up your clothes and you can't do them by yourself and it's sort of a sign of your wealth of whether you do up your own clothes or whether someone else does them. I think mean, the really fun thing about Victorian times is that the Lord Chamberlain used to frequently visit theatre and that if the skirt was, you know, too short they would they could not go on that night. Gentlemen There's something about the look and feel of a lot of period films that allows the audience to sit at a remove from the, the characters. You're allowed to view them as if they're characters on stage, to use the camera work to be in that world with them, and the lighting to really let us feel the textures. And a lot of the, the film isn't lit, you know, it's just light, natural light from windows and that kind of thing, uh, to really get a sense of reality, of immediacy, and a tactile quality to each setting, each location. Most of the film is handheld camera, and therefore it's always at eye level. It's always at the level of the characters engaged in the story. And you don't know if the camera's on you, if it's on somebody else. It's a messy way of filming, and I think for me, my favorite way. You know, I like that mess. You know, when there's a little bit too much order, I, I really want to kick against that. Um, so I enjoy it when you don't really know what they're doing. With the guy with just a camera on his shoulder, the scenes keep going. You better know your lines because you could do... We did five pages of it the other day, very convoluted. 
and over and over again. He, he, he has a wonderful way of getting movement. We shot 360 degrees. Um, it was basically one lighting setup and four characters, and I thought there was a wonderful energy and spirit to the way that we shot it. And it was probably my favorite day on the picture. And the lighting, I think, was fine, but is it the most extraordinary, you know, Academy Award kind of lighting? No. Is it the most spirited kind of loose form, uh, capture the energy of the actor's performance kind of filmmaking? Yes. And that's what Chris was looking for in this film. Ten minutes on stage with my old friend, Mr. Ackerman. Really? To me, it's interesting to be in the maze with the characters moving around, and making the wrong turns with them and all the rest. This film does that, but it also then tries to show the audience the whole maze and see where the different characters are finding themselves. But the narrative itself is quite clearly above those characters. The narrative itself, because of the framing devices and so forth, is presenting multiple points of view and allowing the audience to shift between them. My brother uh, actually put most of the diary material back in. I had stripped a lot of it out, um, and, and he put that back in, and I think it was a very good thing that he did, too, because it was an aspect of the... Again, Christopher Priest had developed this fascinating narrative structure in the book. You're watching a character read another character's thoughts from their diary, so you have access to two different characters' perspective at the same time. So theoretically, these are all subjective points of view. What they add up to, though, is an omniscient position for the audience. The audience is sort of seeing a lot of things that the characters themselves aren't necessarily seeing. They're getting the complete picture. And I thought that would be a very interesting tension between a, uh, the more subjective sort of storytelling that I've done in the past and, um, in a way, a more traditional omniscient position, really, for the, for the audience. But on this one, he's, but he reminds me of Alfred Hitchcock, the way he's doing things. The suspense he holds tremendously. I can see what he's doing with the shots. And then the sudden shock, tremendous. The film isn't really of any genre. It doesn't fit into any neat box, which when thinking about making the film and indeed making it, uh, is tremendously liberating and a lot of fun. And it was really one of the very attractive qualities to the story. A good illusion works very much like a novel in that it has a narrative, it has a story. And for a long time I was trying to think if I could get something out of that, if there was a, a story that could be told in the same way so that the, the, the various secrets of the story are unraveled in the way that a magician unravels the secrets of a trick. It taps into that same human quality of hope and faith. These things don't make sense. Faith doesn't make sense. But we all want to have faith in something. And magic is that feeling of like, <gasps> something impossible can happen. And this was, a, in a way, a challenging adaptation. But I think a really great way to do it for the first time because you have such a surplus of ideas, so many to work with. It really was just a question of choosing the ones I liked the best. All the metaphors uh, and all the symbols in the novel are very literary ones. They work as literature. What I've liked about the screenplay of The Prestige is the way that the Nolans have turned very many of those metaphors into visual metaphors. Attempting to emphasize particular, um, particular props uh, that repeat. I mean, in the case of The Prestige, the, the birds in cages and the idea of wound up working its way into every aspect of the film, things that can repeat through the film and find natural repetition and natural cycles to themselves, which you're letting your mind just roll with that imagery and use it where it sees fit. I mean, quite often you do wind up with a, an interesting set of internal rhythms and, and echoes to the narrative. He simply disappears? That's not a trick. But he has to come back. There has to be a... A prestige. Exactly. The filmmaker, almost more so than the novelist, uh, has, a, has a very uh, close relationship with the magician in terms of the way in which we're using the, the release of information, what we tell the audience when the point of view uh, that we're drawing them into, we, we use those techniques to, to fool an audience, to engage an audience in, in all kinds of blind alleys and, and red herrings and so forth, and then ultimately, hopefully, uh, a successful narrative payoff. Wow.
And that's what I think Chris did so well, is in you know, doing, doing a movie about rivalry, happens to be about magicians, and explaining you know, this whole notion of the pledge, the turn, the prestige, of how a magic trick works. And then without really realizing it, the viewers are also being shown a, an absolute magic trick throughout. And they're being told they're being shown a magic trick, but you don't kind of realize it, um, or you don't believe it. And then um, by the time you finish, when I read the script, and again, when I saw the movie, I just want to jump straight back in and see it for a second time, because you know that the second time you're seeing it with, with a whole different perspective. Are you watching closely? Well, Tesla is just a, a fantastic figure, just an extraordinary life, extraordinary man. Uh, in a lot of ways, I felt too big to deal with uh, in, a, in a film about him himself. I think approaching him uh, in this tangential way where he's a minor character, but very important character uh, in a bigger story was a, was a very interesting way to address his specialness, his extraordinary, um, extraordinary achievement, really. I mean, he's somebody who did things that still haven't been fully explained today. So there's a great sense of mystery, a great aura of uh, scientific possibilities that were raised and perhaps not followed fully for various reasons. Uh, there's a great, great deal of mystery to the man that uh, people have enormous fascination with. There's also something of the underdog about his story in that uh, he was right about so many things. I mean, the alternating current that we all use today um, was his invention. Tesla was right about a lot of things, uh, but a lot of his ideas ultimately were rejected by the scientific community of the day. Even this greatest, one of the greatest scientists of all time, he was a genius, was also obsessed with the things that we didn't understand. And magicians have always, through time, tapped into that. What I really liked about Tesla was that during his lifetime, he built and patented many inventions which he then buried in secrecy and they've never emerged. And so it seemed to me quite fair game for a novelist that Tesla would be able to come up with something um, the like of which had never been seen before, which was very useful to me as a novelist and extremely useful to the character as a magician. I mean, for me, the relationship between Borden and Tesla is interesting because they're both people who can see beyond and conceive things beyond everyday reality and understand effortlessly the world that they've devoted their intellect to, but don't perhaps understand the best way to, to sell it, don't deal with the political or practical realities of you know, how, you, how you channel that, that talent. David Bowie was my uh, first and only choice to play Tesla, so uh, he took a little bit of convincing, but uh, it's it's relatively easy to convince somebody when you you're going to them and saying you're the only person that can play this part. Uh, so it, it took a little while to convince him, but uh, he he signed on in the end, and uh, I got my Tesla. Hold out other hand. I like films that spin off in all sorts of different directions in your head once you've seen the film. So uh, I would hope people would walk away having been uh, hopefully very entertained by the story, but that there would also be all kinds of resonances and, I don't know, interesting thoughts banging around their brains.